For the introduction, I just am enormously appreciative and grateful and uh, honored, humbled to, uh, to be here today. Um, thank you to the Schoberg Foundation, to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, to the Karolinska for uh, to this recognition. Uh, it, uh, uh, it was such a, an enormous and wonderful surprise during the pandemic um, that I almost missed it, in fact. The, uh, Rune kindly called um, to uh, inform me of the, of the outcome of, their, of the, um, the committee. And uh, since it was the pandemic, he called my work phone and I wasn't there. And uh, he sent an email saying, please email or please call me as soon as possible. And I thought, what a tremendously intelligent scam to receive an email from the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, who, what scientist wouldn't want to receive that email? Please call this number, just give your bank details, and we'll, uh, we'll give you a prize. Uh, so I didn't actually call him back right away, and after an hour or two, I thought, you know, I may be incredibly rude. I really should call, uh, call uh, back, and, um, and indeed... Uh, at about 10 p.m., I think, he was still awake, and um, uh, so I apologize for the late, late call. Um, but thank you all for, for being here today. Uh, we'll uh, tell you a little bit about, uh, as you just heard about, about molecular glues, these unusual compounds that will take two proteins and increase their affinity for one another. And in the case of increasing the affinity of a protein for a ubiquitin ligase, that glue will result in the degradation of, of new substrates. And this is really an incredible pharmacologic story that began many years ago with the development of thalidomide in the uh, 1950s in, in Germany by the company Grunenthal. And they identified this molecule that had sedative properties, made people sleepy, and had antiemetic properties, decreased nausea. And in their preclinical models in, rice, in, in mice and in rats, the compound had really no toxicity at all, even with very, very high doses. They thought this was really a miracle compound. It was incredibly safe uh, and had these very useful pharmacologic properties. So it would be perfect for use in pregnancy uh, to decrease morning sickness. And it was very rapidly adopted, uh, approved in over 20 countries, and uh, even over the counter in many countries, because it was thought to be just completely safe, easy to use. Um, and in the United States, unusually, there was a woman named Frances Kelsey, a pharmacist and a physician who was uh, just starting at the FDA, and one of her first jobs was to approve thalidomide. This was an easy job, already been approved in many countries, um, but she said, uh, I won't approve it. I don't see any data here that says it's safe to a fetus. And so she blocked it in the United States. And, uh, and it then those days, the pharmaceutical companies could just call up the FDA and apply pressure. And she um, held firm and, and didn't approve it until she saw data that it would be safe in the fetus. And as, at around that time, there were these first reports of, a, uh, of phocomelia, limba defects, that were occurring in children born to mothers who had taken thalidomide during pregnancy. And, and that was actually hard to detect at first because it was uh, relatively rare. Thalidomide was so used so commonly that uh, people would often not even mention to their, their physician that they took thalidomide. Um, but then larger series, and, and it became clear that over 10,000 babies were born uh, with phocomelia, um, but none in the United States because of the work of uh, Frances Kelsey. And, and this is a picture of her receiving an award from uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, Distinguished Federal Civilian Service uh, Award for, um, for this work. And she actually stayed at the FDA for another 45 years. And the modern FDA, the way that our drugs are approved now in the United States, is largely built on the experience of thalidomide and the catastrophe that happened and now all the checks and balances that, that we have uh, for new drug approval. Now from that, thalidomide uh, was obviously withdrawn to, from the market immediately, but it had interesting pharmacologic properties. It has a very powerful inhibitor of TNF-alpha, actually was used, um, uh, is used for the treatment of erythema nodosum related to leprosy. Um, it also has some mild anti-angiogenic properties, which prompted a series of clinical trials, actually quite a large number of clinical trials in cancer. Um, and while the anti-angiogenic effects are relatively mild, it had striking effects in multiple myeloma, uh, 
leading to the FDA approval for, of thalidomide in multiple myeloma. And then these derivatives of thalidomide, lenalidomide and pomalidomide, relatively minor derivatives, but have orders of magnitude greater uh, potency for TNF-alpha inhibition, were uh, tested and have even greater activity in multiple myeloma. Uh, such that lenalidomide now has uh, about $10 billion a year in net sales because of the, uh, of the extraordinary activity. In addition, lenalidomide has activity in uh, myelodysplastic syndrome with deletions of chromosome 5Q, which just happened to be the very subtype of disease that uh, I'd started working on as a postdoctoral fellow and continued to work on when my lab started. And the incredible activity of this drug specifically in, uh, in this molecular subtype made me extremely eager to understand why that was um, and, uh, and embarked on these studies. Now, the first findings were that thalidomide and lenalidomide bind to a protein called CRBN. This was discovered by Hiroshi Honda's lab for thalidomide and our lab for lenalidomide. And the, uh, the molecules bind the, this CRBN, which is the substrate receptor for an E3 ubiquitin ligase complex. E3 ubiquitin ligases are the machinery, the enzymes, that target specific proteins for destruction in a cell. CRBN is the uh, recognition component that recognizes those specific proteins for destruction. Now, the assumption was if you have an enzyme and you have a drug that binds to it, it must be an inhibitor. Almost most of our drugs are inhibitors of, of enzymes. And so um, the Honda lab and our lab initially thought, no, this is clearly an inhibitor. And we spent actually quite some time trying to figure out if you block this enzyme, what proteins accumulate. If you block an enzyme that causes de degradation of proteins, if you, then there must be some proteins that will accumulate. But we got nowhere with that and finally did this mass spec experiment. This was our very first global proteomics experiment in multiple myeloma cells because we didn't have uh, myelodysplastic syndrome cells that we could study. So we tested uh, uh, lenalidomide in these myeloma cells and no proteins accumulated, but these just handful of proteins decreased in abundance, uh, which is exactly the opposite. So contrary to what we were thinking, that I had actually assumed that the postdoc had switched the tubes and had reversed the entire experiment. Um, uh, and these were transcription factors, which, uh, again, do not, uh, are not what we think of as druggable. They don't have uh, uh, active sites for an enzyme. They don't have drug binding sites. Um, but they decreased quite rapidly. And so we followed up into this Western blot, and you can see that even at 100 nanomolar, these proteins are starting to go away. Higher concentrations, they're almost completely gone. Um, and this happens over just a few hours, um, and the mRNA doesn't change. So something was resulting in the very rapid loss of these proteins. What we found then uh, was that, uh, as I mentioned, lenalidomide binds CRBN, the substrate receptor for this E3 ligase complex. And when the drug is bound, there's an increased affinity for particular proteins, including these two transcription factors, IKZF1 and IKZF3, also known as Icarus and ILOS. And those proteins don't seem to bind this uh, ligase without the drug. So these are true neosubstrates. They are only binding uh, when the drug is present. And when the drug is present, we can see polyubiquitination of uh, these proteins, and that's a mark for destruction of the proteins. And then that polyubiquitinated transcription factors are targeted by the proteasome for destruction. It turns out that these transcription factors, IKZF1 and IKZF3, are essential lymphoid master transcription factors, and multiple myeloma cells require the expression of IKZF1 and IKZF3 to survive, and when they are degraded, the multiple myeloma uh, cells die. And if we mutate the uh, IKZF1 and 3 to make them undegradable, the myeloma cells survive. So this is really responsible for the uh, activity of lenalidomide, thalidomide, and pomalidomide in, in multiple myeloma. However, my lab had actually been interested in myelodysplastic syndrome, and we could not explain the activity of these drugs and, and deletion 5Q MDS just on the basis of IKZF1 and IKZF3 because those are really transcription factors involved in lymphoid B and T cell differentiation. So we went back to proteomics and instead of doing proteomics in multiple myeloma cells, we looked in acute myeloid leukemia cells and we found another substrate called CK1-alpha, casein kinase 1-alpha. 
And amazingly, CK1-alpha is in the common deleted region for deletion 5QMDS, one of only 40 genes or, uh, that is encoded in this small deleted region and is actually expressed both at the mRNA and protein level at 50% normal levels when um, there's a deletion of one allele of 5Q and, and, and that DEL5QMDS is universally a deletion of one allele, not both. CK1-alpha is an essential protein. If you degrade it, all cells would die. However, we thought that if, if a cell already at 50% levels, further degradation would kill it, and cells with 100% levels might not be killed if it was degraded just a little bit. So that was our hypothesis, that haploinsufficiency, or heterozygous loss, of CK1-alpha sensitizes the tumor cells to uh, drug-dependent uh, degradation. And we validated that CK1-alpha is a bona fide substrate. Uh, it's degraded only in the presence of lenalidomide. Uh, we identified the, uh, the degron, the recognition sequence, you now have crystal structures of it binding. Uh, so it's a bona fide drug-dependent neosubstrate of, of lenalidomide. So we were really excited now. We could prove that deletion of one allele was enough to sensitize cells. We were so excited we made a mouse model so we could delete one allele very carefully. And then we treated those mice with lenalidomide and nothing happened, not, not at all. No toxicity, no activity, and we were very depressed that we had the whole story wrong. However, then we did an experiment that you probably should do before you develop an expensive mouse model, which is to do a cell line experiment. But we'd done all of our cell line experiments in human cells and hadn't even thought uh, to do an experiment in mouse cells. And when we did an experiment in mouse cells, we treated the cells with lenalidomide, nothing happened at all. No, no degradation of CK1-alpha at all. So uh, we then did what you're supposed to do actually before you do any experiments, which is to go back to the literature and found that there's no papers that really were showing that these drugs were active in mice or in rats. And indeed, in the 1950s, it, these were studied in, in mice and rats, and there was no activity or no toxicity of the compounds. But now we understand um, exactly how the drug works, and we could try to figure out why it doesn't work in, in mice. And you can see, um, oops, that's backwards. You can see uh, here when we have mouse cells, these mouse BAF3 cells treated with lenalidomide, nothing happens. If we overexpress the mouse cDNA, nothing happens. But if we overexpress the human cDNA for CRBN, the direct target of the drug, treat with lenalidomide, it works. The uh, abundance of CK1-alpha goes away very rapidly. And then we systematically mutated all the amino acids that are different between human and mouse and found that a single amino acid change at isoleucine 391 to valine, if we express the mouse cDNA with that one amino acid change in a mouse cell, the drug works. So this one amino acid change, a very conservative change, which probably has no effect on the mouse, um, made the mouse insensitive to the drug. And this was the thalidomide catastrophe was obviously a, an enormous event in the field of teratogenicity and any organism you can imagine has been tested with thalidomide. And in general, or all the organisms that have thalidomide teratogenicity have uh, the human uh, residue at that position, uh, including the rabbit, which was known to be responsive to thalidomide. And mice and other organisms that don't have teratogenicity um, have the isoleucine at that position, including one primate species, the bush baby, that has no thalidomide teratogenicity. May seem a very conservative change, but we now know that, that, um, we know that the drug binding pocket actually is uh, the same in human and mouse CRBN. And we knew that the drug bound uh, just fine to mouse CRBN. But the uh, extra methyl group creates a steric bump right where substrates bind, and that just completely blocks uh, the binding of substrates and therefore their uh, ubiquitination and degradation. So we made a mouse that just modifies that single amino acid in its germline. The mice are completely fine. They have uh, no defects at all. And when we treat them, we can see during pregnancy, you can see that uh, wild-type mice, uh, when treated with lenalidomide, have no problems with pregnancy, but uh, the dramatic pregnancy loss uh, when we treat with lenalidomide. And uh, it, it's now thought that uh, maybe tenfold more baby fetuses were lost 
uh, with treatment with thalidomide, uh, didn't survive, um, then had the teratogenicity and had the focomelia limba defects. Um, so this is probably the dominant effect of, of thalidomide in pregnancy. So what causes that very specific um, uh, phenotype of limba defects? So further proteomic experiments by Eric Fisher showed that only in embryonic stem cells, there's a, when you, if you treat those cells with thalidomide or lenalidomide or pomalidomide, there's a protein called SAL4 that is uh, very powerfully degraded, very uh, selectively. SAL4 is a transcription factor that's really limited in its expression to, um, to embryogenesis. And in fact, uh, adult cells don't express it at all, and it hadn't even shown up on our proteomics experiments that we had done in adult uh, cancer cell lines. And it turns out that there's uh, a germline syndrome called Duane uh, Radial Ray Syndrome that has the exact same phenotype as uh, the thalidomide teratogenicity. And in fact, there were children born with this genetic abnormality where the physicians diagnosed it as thalidomide teratogenicity and the mother you know, swore she never took thalidomide. But they had the exact same limb bud defects as well as ear, eye uh, uh, defects, short stature, and, uh, and uh, congenital cardiac abnormalities. So. We think that SAL4 degradation during embryogenesis, during that critical period in limb bud defect, it mediates the uh, thalidomide teratogenicity. So how can we extend this finding? Um, we need to understand what is recognized by the ubiquitin ligase in the presence of a molecule. What's the degron sequence that is required for degradation? So to do this, we've used uh, a very nice reporter, uh, similar to one that Steve Elledge first used, where we fuse a sequence of interest in frame with GFP, followed by an IRS M cherry as a control. And in this system, if there's a degron here, if the protein's going to be degraded, the GFP goes away and the M cherry stays the same. So if we take the full-length ILOS, or IKZF3, and clone it into this vector, and we treat with a drug, particularly lenalidomide and pomalidomide, the GFP goes away almost entirely very rapidly. It's an extremely robust reporter system. If we knock out Cerebron, the direct target of the drug, nothing is degraded at all. And when we did a systematic mutagenesis of the protein, we found that zinc finger 2 here, if we delete that, we get absolutely no degradation. So zinc finger 2 is necessary for degradation, and it's also sufficient. If we take just zinc finger 2 here and clone it into this vector, we can get degradation of GFP with just zinc finger 2 alone, only in the presence of lenalidomide. If we mutate that zinc finger or knock out cerebron, we get no degradation. So we have a very simple single zinc finger degron that is capable of mediating drug-dependent degradation. With Nico Tomei's lab, we got a crystal structure of this single zinc finger shown here in magenta, uh, binding to uh, CRBN here in green, and here is pomalidomide. And this is really what a molecular glue looks like. There are contacts between the drug and the zinc finger. There are contacts between pomalidomide and CRBN. Uh, and there are contacts between the two proteins themselves. So it's a proper ternary complex that is stabilized in the presence of the drug. And very tiny differences in the molecule have profound difference changes in the activity of the molecules. For example, this amine that's present in lenalidomide and pomalidomide and not thalidomide mediates uh, a water-mediated hydrogen bond with this glutamine, and uh, that likely increases the potency of, of lenalidomide and pomalidomide by orders of magnitude by 10 to 100-fold over thalidomide. Um, and if we mutate that glutamine, that advantage of lenalidomide and pomalidomide completely go away. So uh, this is, a, uh, this is what, what a molecular glue uh, looks like. The left part of this molecule is called a glutaramid ring, and that is what binds to CRBN, and all derivatives of thalidomide have that glutaramid ring. Any changes to that have, have destroyed activity of the drugs. However, this side, a phalloil ring, the, on the right here, is what interacts with the neosubstrates, and an enormous amount of chemistry has gone on and is currently going on in many labs and many companies 
to change what proteins will interact with CRBN to degrade new proteins. Now, one of the classes of new proteins that we may be able to degrade are zinc finger proteins. And that's interesting because that's the largest class of uh, transcription factors in the genome. And many zinc finger uh, transcription factors are disease relevant, and we would love to be able to target them, but don't have other means of, of targeting them pharmacologically. So we developed a system where we cloned every zinc finger in the genome, about 6,500 zinc fingers, into this reporter vector and treated with various drugs. And we found additional zinc fingers fingers that uh, score um, very nicely uh, and are degraded um, when we treat with pomalidomide. Uh, recently, uh, ongoing work right now in the lab, we've created a second or third generation uh, screening library with every pair of zinc fingers and, and uh, non-canonical zinc fingers, and we've screened a much larger panel of drugs, and we're probably over between 50 and 100 um, transcription factors, zinc finger transcription factors, a number of which are, um, uh, are mutated in cancer, some of which are translocated, targets of translocations in cancer um, that we can target uh, uh, for degradation. So one of the huge questions always in cancer and when we have a drug is how cells become resistant to that drug. Um, and in this case, these degraders have novel mechanisms of resistance compared to other types of cancer therapeutics. One of the ways is that the interface service between CRBN and the substrates can be mutated, and we find those mutations either in our experimental models or um, in, uh, in patients who've been treated for a long time. Another unusual mechanism that we can, we can prove in vitro, uh, but, but hard to prove in vivo, is substrate competition. The ubiquitin ligase may be occupied with some other substrate and not degrade uh, IKZF1 or IKZF3, so we can compete substrates against each other. But perhaps the most common mechanism is just decreased expression of CRBN, and that can happen either by genetic deletion of CRBN or epigenetic downregulation of CRBN, and that is the most common mechanism in both uh, multiple myeloma and, and in MDS. The other really new direction for this field, in addition to finding new substrates that we can degrade by thalidomide analogs, is to find entirely new ubiquitin ligases that may be targeted for uh, uh, modulating substrate specificity and be able to um, uh, target new proteins for degradation. And this is uh, a rapidly evolving field. I'll give you a couple examples, but um, uh, we have uh, many more, I think, uh, coming along. So one example, we used a bioinformatic approach to identify a, uh, a molecule called CR8 that killed cells in a manner that was dependent on ubiquitin ligase activity. And when we treat cells with this molecule CR8, we find selective degradation after very short treatment, just a few hours, of a protein called cyclin K. And on Western blot, you can see that when you treat cells with CR8, the protein really goes away very rapidly. Moreover, if we treat with an E1 inhibitor, an E1 ubiquitin ligase inhibitor, a nettylation inhibitor, which is important for all cullen ring ligases, and our proteasome inhibitor, we completely block the degradation of uh, cyclin K by CR8. So we think this is a molecule that must be acting by targeting uh, uh, cyclin K for degradation. Um, I'll skip the um, straight to the punchline, which it is a molecular glue again, but a very different type of molecular glue. DDB1 is an adapter protein. Normally, DDB1 binds to CRBN or other substrate receptors. In this case, in the presence of CR8 in gray here, there's a new interaction with CDK12. CDK12 normally has nothing to do with the ubiquitin ligase as far as uh, we've been able to determine. But in the presence of the molecule, these proteins interact, and they interact over an enormous protein-protein interface. So they're very compatible surfaces, but they don't interact without the drug. So in the presence of the drug, these proteins interact, and cyclin K is a normal binding partner of CDK12, and cyclin K is presented to the ubiquitin ligase and degraded, just like if CRBN was in this position and Icarus was in this position, it would be degraded. An important implication of this work is that roscovitine, 
which is a CDK12 inhibitor, and CR8 are very similar molecules. They only vary by this two-pyridyl group right here. But roscovitine causes no protein degradation whatsoever, and CR8 is an excellent protein degrader. And that matches with the crystal structure. The, this part of the molecule binds in the ATP binding pocket of CDK12, and the two-pyridyl group sticks out. It's solvent exposed, and it sticks out right where DDB1 comes in and binds. So that's the glue. That's what provides the extra affinity for DDB1 to interact with CDK12 and result in uh, protein degradation. So that raises the possibility that other inhibitors of enzymes might be able to be derivatized to induce an interaction with another protein, and if it, that interaction is with a ubiquitin ligase, it may mediate degradation. So this just, in a cartoon, recapitulates what I just showed. Thalidomide and its analogs act as a molecular glue between CRBN, a substrate receptor, and Icarose. And CR8 acts as a molecular glue between DDB1 and CDK12. CDK12 becomes a neo-substrate receptor, and cyclin K is degraded. And I'll tell you one more quick story that is a, a, another even more crazy uh, uh, mechanism. BCL6 is a very powerful um, oncogene for driving lymphomas and is commonly translocated uh, and mutated in cancers. And so it's been a goal to inhibit BCL6 for a long time. Uh, the pharmaceutical company Boehringer Engelheim is, is engaged in a, a long-term effort to try to inhibit it, and they identified some inhibitors that were relatively weak. They didn't work great in their, in their models, but they recognized that one of the molecules they created was a degrader. It made uh, BCL6 go away, and uh, they um, uh, uh, published the molecule uh, uh, without understanding its mechanism, which allowed us to explore it. Looks like uh, all the dots except for BCL6 disappeared on this one, but BCL6 was incredibly powerfully degraded. In fact, there's no other points, you can't see them, in this uh, lower left. Um, so it's incredibly powerfully and selectively degraded. Um, we worked on this, we, couldn't, we found the ubiquitin ligase, it was important for it, but we found that it was not a molecular glue with the ubiquitin ligase. But what it was doing is it was a molecular glue with itself. BCL, it, uh, in the presence of the drug, BCL6 polymerizes and forms these beautiful fibers that you can see on negative stain uh, electron microscopy. And it's mediated by interactions between the drug and two homodimers of BCL6. And since it's a symmetric protein, it continues to polymerize and uh, eventually we determine this cryo-EM uh, cryo structure of these fibers of uh, BCL6 that are formed. And once that forms, um, uh, we find in two genome-wide CRISPR screens that uh, a protein called CO1, uh, a ubiquitin ligase CO1, it, uh, ubiquitinates and degrades BCL6. So another mechanism for targeted protein degradation may be polymerization and subsequent degradation. And one last therapeutic story is, um, is around uh, CAR T cells. You may know that chimeric antigen receptor T cells are uh, a really exciting and powerful new approach to targeting cancers for, uh, uh, therapeutically by engineering T cells to, have an an uh, to target cells with a particular antigen on their surface. The challenge with this therapy is that it's a live drug. The T cells proliferate enormously, uh, and patients can have a cytokine release syndrome, which uh, carries a lot of morbidity and, in some cases, mortality, sends many patients to the intensive care unit. And we can't control that without eliminating the drug very well. So we've tried sticking a lenalidomide-sensitive degron, that zinc finger I told you about. In fact, we mutated it and made what we call a super degron that's degraded at even lower concentrations of the drug. If we stick that on to this uh, CAR construct, onto the chimer chimeric antigen receptor, we can add lenalidomide, and that chimeric antigen receptor is degraded. The T cell survives just fine, and as soon as we take away the drug, that receptor comes back. And so we can show both in vitro and in vivo this will relieve the cytokine release because the, the T cells stop attacking the cancer cells. And when we take away the drug, the, the T cells go back to killing cancer cells. And so 
potentially creating a manner for controlling the activity of these uh, CAR T cells or other cellular therapies. So finally, I wanted to take a step back and, and uh, think about uh, molecular glues. And these were described uh, in terms of a, a therapeutic uh, several decades ago by Stuart Schreiber, who showed that these natural products, cyclosporin and FK506, actually act as molecular glues. They uh, increase the affinity between cyclophilin and calcineurin A and B in the case of cyclosporin, and between FKB. P12 and calcineurin A and B in the case of uh, FK506. And, and like rapamycin, these are powerful um, uh, immune suppressants used widely in transplant and in, uh, in autoimmune disease. And, uh, and, and they act exactly like I've described before as, as uh, molecular glues between proteins. These drugs were hard to advanced based on that knowledge into new therapeutics, but cyclosporin and FK506 remain uh, mainstays of immunosuppression in a variety of circumstances. On the degrader side, there are really two flavors. I've uh, told you about these molecular glues, the thalidomide derivatives, um, and that small changes in uh, this part of the molecule can change the substrate specificity, and so that is a very rapidly developing field uh, still where we're finding new proteins that can be degraded by new analogs. Um, and again, there's a broad protein-protein interface that provides specificity as well as interaction of the drug with both proteins. In addition, there are these so-called protax or bifunctional degraders. And these have three components. There's a part of the molecule that binds the E3 ligase, including in some cases the glutaramid compo component of thalidomide analogs, and uh, a component of the molecule that binds some protein target of interest and a linker between those. And that approach is very facile. If you have a protein that you want to degrade and it has a ligand, you can often develop a protac that will result in protein degradation. The challenge pharmacologically of the protax is that these are large molecules because they have three, these three components and drug development requires um, optimizing all three components uh, in an interrelated fashion. However, there are several protac molecules that are now in clinical trials that um, uh, have initial efficacy, and there are dozens more in development. So I think while there are several uh, molecules in development on both of these, I think there will be dozens of both types that will be developed in, in the coming years. So to summarize, um, thalidomide derivatives act as molecular glues with a particular E3 ligase, the CRL4 CRBN ubiquitin ligase. In multiple myeloma, degradation of IKZF1 and IKZF3 results in antimyeloma activity. In deletion 5QMDS, CK1 alpha degradation is responsible for the activity. And they, these uh, thalidomide analogs uh, target many zinc finger proteins as well as some other proteins for degradation and new derivatives are going to lead to degradation of new classes of substrates um, that may have therapeutic utility. CR8 acts as a molecular glue between DDB1 and CDK12, creating a new substrate receptor, um, and that model may be extended as well. And BI3802 acts as, uh, to polymerize BCL6, and then that uh, results in the subsequent ubiquitination and degradation of BCL6, and we're now looking for other small molecules or other mechanisms that a uh, protein may be polymerized and subsequently degraded. And I wanted to thank the enormous number of uh, scientists who've uh, uh, pushed this work forward, um, too many to name, um, but I wanted to particularly mention Jan Kronka, Mikolai Slabiki, two postdocs in the laboratory, and two graduate students, Quinn Sievers and Emma Fink, who uh, led an enormous amount of this work. Uh, Eric Fisher and Nico Tome are structural biologists who've uh, been uh, enormously uh, important for this work and really accept, and, and then all the rest of my lab, uh, current and past members, and really uh, accept this award uh, on their behalf. And, uh, and then finally, thank my family. Uh, my wife, Jane, is here, uh, and uh, my children for their support and love, and uh, certainly would not have been able to do any of this work with, without their support and tolerance. So thank you very much. <laughs>